You mean becoming a jaguar and all that? Yeah. What, what's happening there? Or are they the night birds? The night with the owls is that? It's everything happens. I mean, they used to, when I first went to the Amazon, they used to say to us, the, the Indians and the folks who helped us haul our stuff around, they, they would say, uh, La selva como un sueño. It's like a dream. The forest is like a dream. And I thought that that was a, a poetic metaphor of some sort, you know, like it's not. It's that um, you need to read various people who've written on the boundary between wilderness and settled space. When you go into the jungle, language becomes everything. And unbelievably bizarre things happen, and they really do happen. I've seen this in, in myself, because when I first went to the Amazon, I knew virtually no botany. I only knew drug botany, because I was so focused on that. We would, row down, we would go down these jungle rivers, and there would be hours that would pass where no, no words related to where I was would come to me. I called it the big green. That's what it was to me. It was the big green, and there was a lot of different kinds of green, and that was it. Well, then the next time I went to the Amazon, I was with professional field botanists. And we would go out into the jungle, and these guys were just like children. You know, I'd say, look at this. This is a palacorea. Look at these varola trees. Uh, look at this hyalcyanthus. Look at this. Look at this. And soon my mind was filled with language about the green. And the green all disappeared. And instead there were plants that I knew and that were familiar to me. And this coming to terms with a local language is very interesting. You see, we... You speak the language you speak, in most cases, because of where you were born. If you were born in Russia, you speak Russian, China, Chinese. And an interesting thing about these languages is that you really can, they say you can never go home again, but in this rap, you never can leave home. You know, you go to the Amazon. But if you're explaining it to yourself in the language of uh, the East Village, you never leave the East Village. You know, you have somehow carried an envelope of local association with you, and you can never break through it. And so, in a way, you never see the place where you are. It's very important to try and make some accommodation to the local language because in a way only the local language is appropriate to the place you know France is a good example it doesn't make any sense if you don't speak French Germany makes no sense if you don't speak German uh, somehow the local language is a part of the local reality and, and we ignore all this and behave as if everything is very straightforward. The one thing you learn taking psychedelics is that nothing is straightforward. Anybody? Yeah. Uh huh. No, I think there's one transcendental object that exerts attraction wherever it can. You see, evolution, in what evolution seeks to do is to stop itself. 
every organism wants to evolve into what's called a climax ecosystem. That's where everybody has their chair and nobody moves. So there are no empty chairs. You see, everyone has a place to sit, but there are no empty chairs. Where you get evolution is where you have a room half full of empty chairs. Then you have the choice of where to sit. Uh, Most animal species and plant species are not evolving or are evolving very slowly uh, because what uh, uh, evolution tends to dead end itself I mean take cockroaches for example uh, cockroaches achieved their present evolutionary status 200 million years ago they haven't changed an iota we can dig up fossils from the Pennsylvania coal beds that have cockroaches no different except slightly larger than the ones running around in your apartment. So this has been clearly a very successful strategy for cockroaches if the only thing that matters is uh, you know, the propagation of more cockroaches. Nevertheless, their cultural accomplishments have been dismal. (laughs) So, until recently, yes. (laughs) I I had a friend once who who seriously claimed that 60% of the structural integrity of New York City uh, was contributed by cockroaches between the walls, and that if all the cockroaches were to ever march out the whole thing would just fall down. You see, uh, it's thought by the straightest people in the biz that before human beings, the major force creating evolutionary opportunity uh, were rivers. And this happens because the course of rivers will vary over time And that means that rivers expose and inundate a lot of land. So along rivers, you find what is called, um, well, I can't remember what it's called. I'll name it. It's called unclaimed territory, sandbars, and, and large areas where nothing grows. Well, into those kinds of areas, what are called volunteer species, or invader species can make their way. And these invader species uh, evolve very rapidly. For instance, in a climax tropical rainforest, what you find are enormous trees and vines and then the epiphytes and stuff that grow on them. But these trees may flower once every 20 years or so. And when they do flower, they often produce a very limited amount of fruit. What you find along rivers and places like that are what we call weeds. And what a weed is, is a plant that is, number one, annual. It dies every year. And weeds produce enormous amounts of seeds. A weed strategy is a strategy for the rapid invasion and claiming of empty land. And before human beings, uh, rivers were the major creators of empty land. Uh, Carl Sauer, who was a biologist and a geographer, he said, uh, man found the earth a climaxed rainforest, and we will leave it a weedy lot. What that means is we create so much waste land that these annual heavy seeding uh, rapacious plants uh, are replacing the the products of climaxed evolution, which are enormous trees and vines and that sort of thing. Anybody else? This is your last crack. I wanted to bring up a Jack Away and the water learning schedule. Is there any ideas? Well, you were following this thing. Yeah, okay. uh, which book does he talk about? Well, I don't know which particular book. It might be a dimension of white. Oh, Voyage to Magonia is a good one. Is it the new one? I haven't read the new one. I I think Jacques Vallée, I have a a, a lot of respect for most of his work. I thought that book, The Messengers of Deception, was 
so off the track that I actually went to a book signing of his and leafleted the crowd uh, with an attack on it. Shows you what a nut I am. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jacques Vallée had a very interesting approach to understanding flying saucers, and I still think this is the best method. He, 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 his argument went something like this. He said, it's, it's not productive to ask where the flying saucers come from or, or what they want. He said, the way to understand flying saucers is to uh, analyze their effect if you can analyze their effect, that's what they're doing. That's what they want to achieve. So what are flying saucers doing? Talk shows. <laughs> well, they do talk shows, but what is the effect of them doing all these talk shows? What they are doing is they are causing vast numbers of people to doubt science. The re if you analyze what the effect since 1948 of the flying saucers is, is they have caused millions of ordinary people to think scientists don't know what they're talking about. 